ये राम आपकी गाड़ी की जगह किसी ने छीन ली ये गाड़ी कितनी जोरदार है ना हाँ ये सलमान की थी बाइक जैसी लगी हाँ आगे से वही मैंने कहा जी बाइक लेके कौन आ रहा है क्या कर रहे आ जाना चल हाय डॉक्टर नेहा गुड इवनिंग हाय हाय गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर अजीत हेलो हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल या हाय हाय डॉक्टर अजीत एम आई ऑडिबल कैन समवन कंफर्म इफ आई एम ऑडिबल और नॉट गाइस यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल एंड इवन मैम इज ऑडिबल Okay, great. One sec. I think I have some problem with my uh, second. just a second guys i'm not hearing back actually so uh, you know i think there is some problem with my speaker just a minute i cannot hear you actually the problem is that one sec hello 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 okay yes sir i'll also log in with computer minimize the computer
hi guys i can uh, you know speak i think you guys can hear me but i cannot listen to you so i have to connect with uh, another device just a second give me a minute just a minute some problem has happened suddenly it was working till evening I hope it's fine now. Can someone confirm now? If I'm audible? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Ajit. Yeah, you are audible. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Neha. Good evening. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. I'm good. Okay, cool. So I think let's start. We have uh, many participants here, uh, I think 45, and they're joining. And we have around 70 participants in YouTube Live. OK, I think we can start, and then people will be joining You know, uh, by the time. So good evening, everyone, and you're welcome. So today, uh, we are uh, you know, going to start uh, one new uh, webinar series at Climate Research Solutions that is on antimicrobials chemotherapy. It will be a super specialty, as you know, that uh, you know, it is specifically you know, going to be on infectious diseases and their treatment and management. So in the starting of the series, today is module one. And today uh, we will be talking about newer antimicrobials. And to discuss the newer antimicrobials, uh, you know, we have with us Dr. Neha Rastogi Panda. So Dr. Neha Rastogi is, uh, Dr. Neha is working right now as a, uh, you know, consultant infectious diseases at uh, Fortis Hospital Gurgaon. She has done uh, his uh, DM uh, from Ames, New Delhi. And now, uh, you know, she's uh, working, actually she's representing India at WHO also. And uh, she's a co-convener of, uh, you know, Central Infection Control Committee and Antimicrobial Swarship Committee. So uh, let me take a privilege to introduce uh, her. So Dr. Neha has a rich and varied experience of over 10 years and is a specialized medical professional in the management of infectious diseases of both national and international uh, importance. With the COVID-19 and its sequel tuberculosis and drug resistance, TB of lung and other body sites, HIV infections, tropical infections like malaria, dengue, leptospirosis and streptococcus. She also has experience in diagnosis and management of transplant, both hematopoietic and solid organ transplant and cancer-related infections as well. She also had enormous experience in managing difficult fungal infections, deep-seated joint and bone infections, and various orthopedic and surgical site infections. She also has experience in dealing with neurological and neurosurgical, obstetrics and gynecological, eye, ear, and challenging skin related infections. She has been instrumental and pivotal uh, in formulating COVID and hand hygiene policies at Ames Delhi. She has also worked closely with Center uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, on aspects of uh, infection prevention, control, and device associated infections. She has also contributed to formulations of antimicrobial guidelines and app based on antimicrobial policy and stewardships. She also specializes in consultations and advises uh, regarding vaccines and travel health. She takes keen interest in educational activities and research and therefore has to her credit an array of uh, research work and publications. So I uh, must thank uh, Dr. Rastogi for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Dr. Rastogi, for accepting our invitation and uh, you know, starting this uh, uh, first module of the series with us. And uh, you know, thank you, everyone. Uh, for joining us, uh, you know, at this time, uh, you know, in the evening, weekend, seven o'clock Saturday, I can understand what's the, you know, <laughs> and even it's the festival, you know, all around the India, you know, in South India, North India, everywhere, you know, in the different names, but it is a festival day. So thank you, 
uh, for joining us. And uh, you know, this series is a long series. Don't worry about it. We have uh, you know fixed around six uh, modules in this series right now. So every weekend, I'll try uh, to keep it on Fridays, not Saturdays. But okay, as we are starting, so I mean, any weekend, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. But there are six uh, you know modules we are uh, fixing. So registrations will open this week. Uh, registrations means registration fee will be just less, uh, maybe 99 or 199 rupees just for the, you know, uh, technical charges, nothing much for you, everyone. Okay, so you can register for this series as well. And, uh, you know, it is uh, free for our anti micro based worship, uh, you know, interns and students. So don't worry about that. And we are going to, uh, you know, make a huge awareness about uh, anti micro pills and anti micro scholarship. So uh, we are already uh, at 7.12. I'll not take much time. Uh, Dr. Neha, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajit. And uh, thank you, everyone, for sparing your time on Saturday evenings, like he said. And happy Indian New Year to all of you. Yes. So, yeah, on the eve of Indian New Year, we will have the new modules and the new things coming up. So I'll also quickly and I'll try not to bore everyone because like I said, the pressure is huge weekend time. So uh, we'll start the presentation right away. So is the screen visible? Uh, yes, doctor. Right. You can make oh. it full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. So thank you for a generous introduction. First of all, Dr. Ajit. Uh, so why we are discussing actually this webinar, so see, uh, with the two and three waves coming by and passing by, we have actually landed from the situation of COVID to COBAD. What is COBAD? That is a COVID associated actually bacterial infections we have landed up. And uh, nothing fancy which came into my mind, but since we are all the Indian people, so one thing we should all know that why we need to know the newer antimicrobials and why the stewardship is important is to we not need not to make the make empiric rational choices in all the infections. We need to obtain the cultures and we need to know the resistance pattern. We need to know when to de-escalate. So you know the two words are very important. When to escalate to save a life of a patient, and once the life of the patient is saved, save on the drug. That is de-escalation. If you have a report, step it down to a narrow agent. So that is de-escalation. And of course, a very important thing in amongst that is infection prevention and control. So let's get modified here, hence for this uh, webinar, and we should make all the rational choices. So why we are again discussing, uh, so just a brief intro that, you know, either a bug is smart or the human race is smart. The moment we introduce a new drug in a fourth while in the resistance, so I'll try to mix up the things and I want to make this seminar more and more interactive rather. So whenever a new drug comes within a short span, their resistance emerges. That is the beauty of a bug, I should say. And that is the way they survive to create the mutations and survive henceforth. And at the speed of the mutations arising and at the speed the resistance emerging, the speed of the, uh, the discovery of the newer antimicrobials unfortunately does not match because it takes a lot of years and research to bring up one new drug. You know, WHO has already declared the AMR as one of the priority. And, you know, apart from a COVID, AMR itself is a very silent pandemic, which is ongoing throughout the years. And it causes a lot of morbidity and mortality across the countries. So impact we already know, and that is why we are all here to save our nation. We have a lot of morbidity. We have a lot of mortality. We have a lot of antibiotic usage leading to the resistance. Of course, cost is a very important concern in the resource settings like ours. And then it has a potential for dissemination, means it can you know, spread to one population to the another population and cause the resistance in the same area and the strata. So what is actually an antimicrobial resistance? I just want to touch upon before we switch to the newer antimicrobials. So we have already come across a lot of times this term called as MDR, XDR, PDR. So what are they? So antibiotic resistance is something. So for example, one microbe, which is not inhibited, that is, it is still growing in the presence of an antimicrobial agent, which has given at a proper dose, which has that organism. So in spite of giving a right drug, 
at the right time with the right choice your organism is still growing means it is causing a resistance to that particular drug so multi drug resistance or an mdr means that if you have three antimicrobial categories at least more than one agent it is not susceptible if it is an extensive drug resistance it means it is not susceptible to more than one agent almost all categories but at least sensitive to less than two and pan drug resistance means pan drug all the antimicrobial agents it is showing resistance so if you see on the right side we have an mdr amongst them there is a subset which is a extensive drug resistant and then becomes the pan drug resistance and unfortunately at this time we are leading towards this set so who has already declared some of the pathogens as a critical concern Acinetobacter bomini, which is a carbapenem resistant, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, again a carbapenem resistant bug, Enterobacteriaceae, a carbapenem resistant bug itself. They are considered to be as the critical care pathogen list, and they are of the higher priority because of their spreading and a very faster spreading resistance. So, why there is a need of an anti newer antimicrobials? That is because since we have a rapid spread is developing in the resistant environment causing a huge burden on the economic front it causes the therapeutic failure you know a patient is coming a patient is coming and then eventually it is landing into a therapeutic failure because the drug you are giving it's not responding to him then it also causes the increased healthcare stay and increased healthcare stay means increased morbidity more chances of hospital acquired infection so if you talk in terms of the different timelines we have few uh, medicines which are re emerging we have already known these but now we are using it more often like colistine colimixin b minocycline sorry for the typological error chloramphenicol daptomycin the antibiotics which are still under the pipeline there are few and there are new fda approved drugs which we going to talk about which are either lifamulin cefidurocol Amipen, Amrelibactam, Plasomycin. I know these words sound a very tongue twister kind of a thing, but they all have some or the other way contribution to the newer antimicrobial paradigm. So if I classify them, these few big fancy names into the thing, so there are either the old class new drugs are there. So for example, in a gram positive, we already know there were cephalosporins. So the new additions are ceftopiprol. Then we have a new class of agents. we have a glycopeptides so if we can interact and somebody tell me the names of the glycopeptide agents we use you can unmute yourself and answer yes guys please try to answer one of the commonest glycopeptide agent used in the gram positive foci infections we are waiting for the responses uh, you can also write in the chat box yeah someone has written okay that's that's good uh ticoplanin that's one and also we have heard about vancomycin so they are rather very common glycopeptides being used so this is actually a mixture where you have a glyco plus a lipo chain we'll talk about it then we also have something called as the uh the oxazolidinron Edisolid is a newer one. The older one is, which we all use. Hey, so linezolid, linezolid is the older version of this same compound class. So I I request everyone to be more interactive because otherwise, since it's a new thing, new microbes, we should always stick to our basics. and then we can get an updated knowledge so i would be really happy and i'm sure dr rajit will you guys right yes so then, definitely <laughs> yeah people please answer so then we have the gram negative which inhibits the cell wall synthesis so we already have used or known about these drugs called as piperacillin tazobactam cefepirazone sulbactam even meropenem emipenem atapenem and now we have now landed into the category of certain newer antibiotics like ceftolazone tazobactam ciftazidib avibactam i would like to highlight this drug particularly because this is the drug which we are using nowadays 
since we are not left and we have lot of organisms coming which are even resistant to the carbapenems. Then we have certain called as the protein synthesis. So we all know about the minocycline. We have also heard about the tigicycline. And then now the category is called as the iravacycline, omidacycline, they are coming. We know about gentamicin and amicacin. But now a newer aminoglycoside is also coming that is called as the plasomycin. And then there are new molecules. And then we have the old drugs with the new use, like I said. So cholestine, polymyxin B, we used to use it initially in 1900. But then they saw that it causes a lot of issues of nephrotoxicity, etc. And then they stopped using but unfortunately, now again, we landed up into the era when we have a lot of resistance. So cholestine and polymyxin B, these days to have become a backbone of every therapy in an hospital. Because eventually, many of the bugs are resistant to carbapenem and you have to combine somewhere or the other, either a cholestine or a polymyxin B. Then we have a phosphomycin, we have a minocycline. So what is the core of the problem? So just in the interest of time, since we are all learning in the Indian settings, we have a problem major with the gram-negative bacteria. Can anybody tell me the names of the commonest gram-negative bacteria which are common in the hospitals? E. coli. Perfect. Other? Yeah, I can see Hafiz. Yeah, Hafiz, please go on. Is yes. it streptomycin? Pardon? Is it streptomycin, ma'am? Stre pardon? Uh, I couldn't understand. Not streptomycin. streptomycin. No, uh, so I'm asking about the organisms which are common in the hospitals, the gram-negative bacteria. So I could get Klebsiella very nicely said, E. coli, any other? Endamoeba histolytica. So remember I have... Uh, so that's a parasitic agent. Uh, perfect, absolutely. So we already have... Hemophilus influenza is also there. That's very good. Uh, but the drug resistance touchwood, at least in Haemophilus influenza, we are still at the safer grace. So Klebsiella, yeah. uh, E. coli, Acinetobacter, as you have already mentioned, Pseudomonas, I guess everybody has heard of it. So Pseudomonas is another important uh, bacteria. So the, learn the word escape. So we have Eastricia E. coli, ES, K is Klebsiella, P is Pseudomonas, and E is also the Enterobacter. And then, oh, sorry, escape. So we have A also, that is acinetobacter. So just remember this word escape and you will get to know the critical pathogens which I mentioned to you before. You will always remember them. Okay. So what is the core of our problem? So I don't want to go into the molecular level, but since we always hear about these words called NDM, what is this NDM? Can anybody tell me? I mean, that's a brownie point for that person. What is NDM stands for? New Brownian movement. Pardon? New Brownian movement. Okay. No. So basically, the NDM is a new Delhi metallo beta Yeah. So it is a new Delhi mutant strain, which is resistant to almost all the antimicrobials. So I, I just simplify this. A slide for you, resistance in the gram-negative bacilli. So if you have heard of these names called ESBLs, that is extended spectrum beta lactamases, then we have the AMCs, and then now we have landed up into the carbapenemases. So I'll just go through a little basic to for your understanding. So you have heard about the drugs called as the ceftrioxone, cefoxetin, ceftazidine, right? They are all the cephalosporins. So if they are sensitive, we have a balle balle. We all are happy that it's a very common thing. Drug is sensitive. You can give that. So say a situation comes, you have a ceftazidine and a ceftrioxone resistant, but 
if you combine it with say sulbactam or tazobactam or an avibactam that becomes sensitive but when you combine it with the beta lactamase inhibitor it becomes sensitive mean it is having some kind of enzyme production which is breaking the drug and that enzyme is called as the beta lactamases and then they are of different types you can have the extended spectrum beta lactamases you can have the ampicillinases and then you can have the carbapenemases so i'm going to touch about the carbapenemases that is the meropenem imipenem doripenem atapenem four carbapenem which we know if the drug is resistant to all four means it is producing some kind of enzymes which is breaking that drug and that drug is and that enzymes are carbapenemases hope i have uh, uh, simplified this for you and we can discuss it again so i'll just give you a small case so there is a 17 year old female she is diagnosed with cancer and she is on a chemotherapy she got admitted with the fever and she got a respiratory distress and we have to ventilate her we saw her chest x ray it shows pneumonia and when we do a bronchoscopy of that we saw a pseudomonas aeruginosa coming which is only and only sensitive to colesty so you can see on the right side the the sensitivity pattern it has so many drugs but unfortunately all are resistant and this is not a joke but this is the common scenario we say, see face in our hospital on daily basis so what is the option of this patient for this the answer is already written in the red guys <laughs> yes Oh, ma'am, we have to start with cholesterol, which is sensitive. Absolutely. So we have to start with the cholesterol. So what is cholesterol? So we all know we are all using it either a cholesterol or a polymyxin B form. So again, a question: Are they same? What is the polymyxin? Is a class which has polymyxin B and a polymyxin E, which we commonly known as cholesterol. They are working on the outer membrane they are not the cell wall breakers like a carbapenem and cephalosporins but they work on the cell membrane and they work against almost all the bacteria you know what we think doesn't work they actually work but there are certain bacteria to which it is resistant like proteus cerasia burkholderia and stenotrophomonas so always remember guys if you come across these kind of bacteria make sure the cholestine is not on they are resistant to this so what is the difference between a cholestine and a polymyxin i just want to highlight with one line that you know cholestine is not given in the kidney injuries usually because cholestine products causes the kidney injury itself but they are very good in the urinary tract infection whereas polymyxin b is something which is a brother of cholestine but it causes a very less kidney toxicity you can even give in a dialysis patient safely and that is why it is used in the other infections other than urinary tract so the simplified funda is you have a gram negative bacteria in a urine which you think that is sensitive only to cholestine prefer cholestine you have a gram negative bacteria again a carbapenem resistant in a lung for example in the previous case you prefer a polymyxin b then we talk about the other drugs i'll just quickly mention you about them so as to you to know the mechanism of action and what i try to simplify it in the terms of mechanism and their basic spectrum and they are approved for which condition so that you should be aware of these names so plasomycin the name itself says anything with mycin anamycin gentamycin and then now the plasomycin so can anybody tell me already i have mentioned in the slide but you can tell me what is the mechanism of action of amino glycoside yes guys please answer it inhibits the protein synthesis protein synthesis inhibitor protein synthesis inhibitor very good so we get lot of protein synthesis inhibitors answer that's absolutely right uh so it binds to this so we have a protein 30s unit and a 50s unit so it bound to the 30s unit of the ribosome and it inhibit the protein synthesis so this works against the mdr bacterias 
including your pathogens of interest that is klebsiella acinetobacter pseudomonas and even mrsa what is mrsa So we have a participants around fifty, but I can think that the answers are coming from only two and three. So rest forty-seven, please back up. We need to answer for the rest of the slides. So we have, uh, we have so yes, more, uh, Dr. Neha, we have eighteen more participants who are answering in the YouTube live streaming. Oh great! All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Rajit, you keep a watch on them then. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. So, the plazomycin is approved by the FDA for the urinary tract infection, and then the hospital acquired or a ventilator associated pneumonia with sepsis. So, since all the aminoglycoside, so what are the most common uh, side effects of an aminoglycoside? Either they cause a kidney toxicity or they cause the Auditory the auditory toxicity. So, like the class effect, it's it's already an amino glycoside. So, the and it is quite costly, and it is not yet available in India, but soon will be available to us. Then we'll quickly go to a newer compound called as Irava cyclin. Like the name suggests, cyclin. So, it's a class of the glycyl cyclines. It is more potent than your TG cyclin. And it works against the Acinetobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, even MRSA, and a VRE. Now again, a question: What is VRE? Vancomycin resistant. Yes, yes. Vancomycin resistant. They're trying to escape, but I think their uh, voice is, uh, you know, yeah. not clear. Yet. So it's a vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Uh, rest of the participants, if you can mute yourself while we are discussing, and you can unmute while answering. I think there is a lot of background uh, noises. So yes, so it's a vancomycin-resistant enterococci, and as the name and the class suggest, they are approved for any. intra-abdominal that is gastrointestinal tract related infections and the urinary tract infections and there it was affects it causes the hepatotoxicity and they also causes the they you know they increase the effect of warfarin which is an anticoagulant and hence they causes the coagulation derangement and this is also quite costly and again it is yet to be available in india and then we another we see another drug called phosphomycin So phosphomycin as a sachet form we use for UTI. We used to give to lot other lot many females and males for the UTI in a form of a sachet for the urinary tract infection. But here I'm talking about the injectable phosphomycin. So this also works against the cell wall synthesis as well as the protein synthesis, and they are active against Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, E. coli. even including the ndm producing bugs mrsa and even a vre so like i said for the uh, uti infections you only require one dose of it in the uncomplicated infections that is it comes as a 3 g sachet you just have to give it with the water drink it and that's one sachet is enough for a uncomplicated uti episode but for the critically ill patient we go in the iv formulation that is 2 g To four gram six hourly based upon your kidney functions, and IV phosphomycin is yes currently available in India, and we are using it quite often. So, what is the most common issue with the injectable phosphomycin? I just want to highlight that with the injectable phosphomycin, there are a lot of electrolyte disturbances. So, you keep in mind when you are using this that it causes the potassium and sodium disturbance. Then comes another drug, Eloris, that is ceftriaxone, sulbactam, EDTA. So every component has its role. Ceftriaxone, we all know, that's a beta lactam that works against the cell wall synthesis. Sulbactam is a beta lactam inhibitor. Why EDTA is used? We know that EDTA is a chelating agent. But the work of here is since it's a chelator, and I told you that NDM, NDM is also called as the metallo beta lactamases. the metallo word is a metal so anything which chelates the metal will prevents its functioning 
So EDTA here chelates those metallic ions which work as the cofactor for those enzymes which break your drug. So if you combine this with the parent drug, it will help in its entry, its penetration, its stability over a site, and that is why its function. So it's a kind of an adjuvant you are adding along with your parent drug to ease out its entry and to prevent its degradation by the enzymes and hence prevent the resistance. So like I said, that EDTA chelates your ions and that is why they help the entry of the ceftrioxone into the main area where it is supposed to work and hence it prevents the resistance. Another important thing is the bacteria which we have discussed, the, those notorious bacteria, they form a biofilm. So what they do is they form a layer of the sheath where they just stick together and that causes the problem in the drug because drug does not stick to the sheets of the bacteria and that causes the resistance. So this ADTA breaks those short, small colonies called as the biofilms. So this also helps in prevention of the resistance. So I'll go with another question. So again, the patient is, why I'm taking the cancer patient example, because they are the most vulnerable and susceptible to these kind of high-risk infections. So another 28-year-old male has gone for a bone marrow transplant. So at date 11 of the transplant, patient counts are almost zero. And they have a high fever spikes with the chills. And you have a line in the hand. It is a probable source of infection. So we started, paper patient has a high-grade fever. We started with the miropenem injection. However, fever still was continuously spiking up after two days. So we have to add a ticoplanin and then the cholestine. And we sent all the cultures. So after two days, we got a report from the lab that the culture has shown the gram-negative bacilli. And most probably, since the patient is in the hospital for almost 11, 12 days, the most common bugs you guys have already answered, which we see is Acinetoclepsilla, Pseudomonas, E. coli. So we were thinking that probably this, this patient will also grow either of them. So since cholestine has already added, and patient was having fever on that, so are we, are we having any newer agents which can spare the use of cholestine? or which are at par with the cholestine. And sometimes what happens is that we give the cholestine and patient does not have, some patient have allergy or the different responses. So is there any option for such patients? So the idea is that are there any antimicrobials which work at par with cholestine and can be used in place of cholestine? So yes, the answer is yes. So one important molecule I'm going to talk about, this we are using right now quite commonly in many of the patients. So this is ceftazidime and evibactin. So ceftazidime, we all know, is a third-generation cephalosporin. Avibactin is a beta-lactamase inhibitor of the non-beta-lactamase classes. So like sulbactin, tazobactin, and then the next generation is the avibactin. So it covers ESBLs, AMPC, most of the drugs, the acinetobacter. It does not cover your NDM producing bacteria. And it is approved for the intra abdominal infections, UTI, hospital, and ventilator acquired pneumonia. So the cost here is per vial of 2.5 gram, cost roughly around 5,200 to 6,000 rupees. And it has been used, like I said, in many of the guidelines in the different spectrum of infections I have just mentioned. So why is so now the question rises if the ceftazidime evibactam is such a beautiful drug, but unfortunately it does not cover the acinetobacter and metallobeta lactamases. So what will be the next probable choice? So the next choice is we also have a astronam. Now the beauty of this astronam is that you are, I think you have all heard about the word astronam and this drug. So the beauty of the drug is astronam works very nicely against the NDM or the metallobeta lactamases. So you have a ceftazidime avibactam which works against all except MBL and you have an astronaut which works on MBL and not the others. So if you combine them together, the, the positivity will be quite high. So hence, now we have started the combination of these two agents. That is ceftazidime avibactam 
and the addition of the astronaut expands the spectrum of the cover so that our ndm bugs are also being taken care and so that we can have a more spectrum and we are trying to spare the cholestein using this the combination right so the next in the pipeline is the cephalazone azobactam like all others which we have just discussed it also covers the esdl pneumonia klebsiella pneumonia proteus cerecia pseudomonas aeruginosa acinetobacter but again it has a problem that it does not cover properly the ndm bacteria and it is also approved for the most of the time intra abdominal infection and the complicated uti again another class is the meropenem weberbactam i'll just quickly go through because most of them have a similar spectrum of action they have just changed the molecule and they changed the beta lactamase inhibitor to give a proper desired cover of the all bacteria the similar with the imipenem relibactam now i come to this drug particular it has a very interesting mechanism cefidrofol it is yet to be available in india however we have imported this drug for one patient of ours who is a very high profile patient so cefidrofol has a sidrofor based action so what is the sidrofor cefidrofol is just like a normal beta lactam but it binds to the iron and then it with the help of the iron transporter system it goes directly into the primary plasmic space using this system so it's just work like that you take a molecule use it as a vehicle go to the desired destination and work there so it is a very good bactericidal agent it also works like i said it's a beta lactam it works on a cell wall synthesis by binding to their proteins but since it has its own transporter mechanism so it does not get deactivated by those enzymes and hence this has a very unique mechanism of action and a you can it has still found to be resistant so it can prevent the resistance and that is why it's a new drug on the molecule which we are awaiting and waiting for to help the treatment of our resistant organisms so right now it has been approved for the patients elderly ages with the complicated urinary tract infection however i tell you that this molecule cost around 4.5 lakh for 10 vials so it is yet to be available at a very subsidized and a cheap rate in india settings so the the points which i have just mentioned in the previous slides i'm sure you must be and anyone can be confused by seeing all those slides in a tandem but this is able to show the uh, you know the gist of all so we have multiple enzymes and it the mbls and the oxa we all have in common along with pseudomonas and acinetobacter so if you ask me so the reds are showing that they have no activity and the greens are the active so if you say that ceftolazone tazobactam and the ceftazidime mevibactam which we commonly use they have no activity against the mbls or the ndm bugs but like the the green the red ones which i have mentioned they have the majorly active against lot of agents so they are very important in the treatment of the most of the pathogens so for example i give you an example so this is a test we put so the same patient where we saw a pseudomonas which was resistant to all and only sensitive to policy so somewhere we say give the person the policy still the patient did not improve so i wanted to see that what kind of done and we saw that on that patient the ndm was detected now if we go to the previous slide and if i want to choose any of them for example if cost is no bad i will prefer to choose the cefidrofol but in our indian settings like i said that we have a ceftazidime evibactam available and if i combine with the astronam we can cover both the ndm as well as the other so in this particular patient what we did was we combine the ceftazidime evibactam with astronam and stop the cholestein and the patient found to be better now coming to the another two three uh, drugs so there is another patient who is an 80 year old female she is a she is an obese female she has a problem of the sleep apnea and she snores most of the time and she has a tracheostomy and she is on a home based ventilator system now she got admitted with fever 
she had lot of brachial secretions and her ventilatory support got worsened up we sent the cultures from the endotracheal tube and it found to have an acid and minocycline so apart from colistine there are two drugs which i should mention when we are discussing with the acinetobacter bomini they are the common drugs but we specifically use it not only for the acinetobacter but they are found to be good for other agents as well so one is the sulbactam so only molecule sulbactam is a beta lactamase inhibitor but it also has a direct activity against the acinetobacter proteins so it helps in the not only when you are combining with the drug it helps in the better penetration of that drug but itself this molecule has the activity against acinetobacter so one a drug itself is an activity it will help the drug to have an activity and this molecule itself has activity so three win win situations for you against the acinetobacter bomini so it is very good for the pneumonias caused by the acinetobacter bomini at least the dosing is very high 2 g to 4 g up every 6 hourly and the maximum up to 8 g we use but this drug we have found to be very useful when we are dealing with the acinetobacter pneumonias another is a minocycline we lot of time use minocycline in the treatment of acne right but minocycline has been found to act against lot of the multi drug resistant strains of acinetobacter and it the beautiful part is it can be given both iv and oral form so the bioavailability is almost the same so you can use it you know mutually you can give iv also and you can give it oral also very minimal side effects and it works very nicely against the acinetobacter strains so if i think the uh, time allows we can switch to this slide so we can go back to few discussions and all ma'am han ji uh, what about uh, piprazilin tazobactam in mdrs netobacter bomani so uh, like it, it can work so actually the topic is more about the newer antimicrobials so i just touched upon the new discoveries but okay. yes piprazilin tazobactam does work but you know unfortunately shabana we are living in the era when we see 100 reports of acinetobacter hardly one or two will be found to have a piperacillin tazobactam sensitive we have landed okay. up in that era of mdr okay ma'am yeah so uh, dr rajesh should we go ahead with the gram positive or i think i, just... I think so we can go ahead and we can have a five minutes discussion later uh, dr neher sure so gram positive i'll just quickly touch upon two three drugs so one is a daptomycin so this drug has come up very big way because you know we have learned from the vancomycin picoplanin and then lenazolid this daptomycin is a very good agent against the vancomycin resistant strains of enterococcus methicillin resistant strains of staph aureus and even also work against the streptococci like i said it works a uh, bactericidal against uh, action against all those bacteria it is safer than the vancomycin also and has a very good penetration in the bone area so very good for joint infections so that is why it is approved for skin soft tissue infections endocarditis prosthetic joint infection and osteomyelitis too so basically the daptomycin has a unique mechanism of action it works against the cell membrane and then it forms the complex again with this calcium dependent matter to these cell membrane complexes causes the depolarization all the losses of the ions and all and causing the cell death so i'll just skip to this then coming to the another thing that is called as a ceftaroline we have heard about the cephalosporins in the gram negative arm so this is a fourth generation cef uh, cephalosporin which works very nicely against the gram positive bacteria so it works against mrsa vancomycin intermediate sensitive staph aureus even linezolid resistant staph aureuses and even those staph aureuses which are not susceptible to dapto also so this is approved for skin soft tissue infections and community acquired pneumonia i have used in couple of patients and this uh, the one vial cost around 2500 rupees and it has a very good lung penetration so it's a very good drug of choice for the pneumonias due to the resistant staph aureus strains then another is the omada cyclin like the tetracycline group cyclin word itself it has a mechanism of action similar to that 
It also used in the community acquired pneumonia and a skin soft tissue infection. And the spectrum majorly involves the gram positive, but also it has action against the ESBL producing gram negative bugs as well. And then the last is a tedizolid that is, has its own issues. The linozolid is a very good drug of choice, but it causes a lot of bone marrow suppression. After a few days of linozolid, the patients land up in the platelet low count, low TLC, anemia. So it is very potent. Tedizolid is very potent at par with the linozolid with the lesser of the side effects as compared to the linozolid. So again, if you ask me in terms of this MRSA, vancomycin resistant staph, vancomycin resistant E. coli, penicillin resistant strep pneumonia. So all these three works very nicely against almost all the common gram positive bugs and they are the need of the new generation because they have a limited side effects, very good penetration of the tissues and an equal spectrum, rather a better spectrum against the existing drug resistant strains. To all this thing, one very important question I would like to know or I would like to know the views before I stop this, that most important thing whenever you are dealing with the resistance strain is not the drug you know. You know hundreds of drugs, but which drug to choose where? And you know, many times the problem hands is that a patient comes, he is very sick or she is very sick. And you don't have to time, you will send the culture, but you can't wait for a culture to come and then you start the antibiotic because it will be too late. So what drives you then that which antibiotic to be chosen in that point is your antibiogram. So what is antibiogram is? So for example, like uh, uh, I work in Fortis. So last one year at Fortis, whatever our microbiological data says, that for example, in last one year, in majority of the patients who have lung infection, our acinetobacter and Klebsiella are the most common. And amongst them, cholestein sensitivity and Zevisefta sensitivity is most common. So I already know that the last one year, the most common bugs are these, and this is their resistance pattern. That will help me to decide that this is the time I should add this because most of the bugs are like that, right? So I'll give you an example. So this is a liver disease patient who got, and he got ventilated in view of the altered sensorium. And on the ventilator day four, we have increased TLC count, fever is there, and we have a pneumonia. The patient was on ceftrioxone when he landed up in the emergency. And after four days of ceftrioxone, this is the condition. So for sure, the patient has worsened on the ceftrioxone. Now we need to increase the treatment. So what are we going to increase? Either we do to piperacillin tazobactam or go to meropenem or straight away I add a cholestine or a polymyxin, add a gram-positive cover, say a linozolid because patient is just on ceftrioxone or should I ask for the antibiogram? Mm -hmm. Cholestine, mom. Okay. Ask for antibiotic. Okay. Any other answers? Uh, Pipragulin tasobacterium. Okay. First, we have to give a prophylaxis, then we have to go for antibiogram. Okay. Uh, so, patient is already on ceftrioxone. So, do you want to continue with ceftrioxone or you want these options, either of them? Oh, we will go through the antibiogram and then choose the right antibiogram. All right. So I want more answers. Yes. We can stop the septriaxin and start with cholesterol or polymyxin B. Okay. I'll go put the clothes for the Okay. So most of the people believe that either it is in asking the antimicram. Or we can straight away jump to the cholestein because I have shown the slide which shows a lot of resistant bugs. So yes, the correct answer is actually the you should ask for the antibiogram. And like I said, that you know this is the guidelines of BAP guidelines. So this is the ventilator associated pneumonia guidelines. So even if you have asked said the Brazilian tezobactam, I should say yes, it is right. Even if you have said the meropenem, that is also correct. 
if you have said even a polymyxin B or cholestin, which many of you have said, that is also correct. And if your MRSA is more than 10% in your hospital, even the option four is correct. But we cannot add all four together. So the best way is know your prevalence. If your hospital bug, if you know that your hospital has less than 10% of MRSA, at least I can start lenozolid later sometime, not right now. So we can at least start with the gram negative and we can have an options from piperacillin to meropenin to cholestine. So all are correct provided. What is the resistance pattern at your hospital? That is most important. So know your bug to treat the bug. That is the punchline. You should know your hospital, how the resistance pattern at your hospital so that you can decide on the best antimicrobial therapy amongst the choices which we have just discussed. So what, is, what should be the ideal approach to deal with the resistant infections? You should know the risk factors. So for example, a patient, the same patient which we have just discussed, I discharge him on ABC antibiotic. But you know that the patient has a pseudomonas which was resistant to cholestine. And say after 14 days, he comes back again. And he has the same fever, shock, and you grew a gram-negative bacteria. So you might have a knowing fact that this patient is the same patient who has less than 14 days and he grew an MDR bug. So at least I can save on the time and I can directly jump to the resistance pattern or a drug pattern of the previous episode. So you should know the risk factors, identify them before you start the therapy. Then include your antibiogram, which I have just mentioned. Initiate with the most rational choice. And the rational word, I believe, is two-way. The most broad spectrum, which will cover majority of the bugs, and the intention is to save the patient. So, like, for example, this is a list. I can share the presentation. I think it's getting recorded too. So, we have a lot of broad spectrum agent based on the site-specific infection. For example, UTI. For example, the respiratory tract infection and even the surgical site or the skin soft tissue infection. Then the next is that, you know, infection prevention and control is very, very important. And at last is if you have any issues at any point, you should have an infectious diseases specialist at your bay to help you out in this way. So thank you all for your all patient listening. So to war against the superbugs, we all guys, we have to be the superheroes. Save on the antibiotic, first of all, use rationally, save the patient and timely stop the higher antibiotic. So thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. Ask, you all can ask your questions now, guys. Please ask your questions. So I, if no, no other questions, so I can ask people that what are the different antibiotics you use in your hospitals? So anyone can answer or you can again use the chat box to answer. Okay, I'll just... Polystin. Mm -hmm. Then meropinum. Right. Ceftazidim avibactum. All right. Tigicycline, minocycline. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when intrathecal uh, amicacine, intrathecal polystin, intrathecal mm -hmm. vango we have given. Very nice. So, Shabana, where, which patients you have used the TG cyclins, say, for example, if you can enlighten the audience also. So, I'm very nice. So, yeah. Uh, the patient was actually on, uh, uh, patient was on vancomycin, actually. Mm -hmm. And later, uh, uh, the patient was not tolerable to the vancomycin and we uh, de-escalated to the um, ticoplanin mm -hmm. uh, later to the TG cycling. Okay, and what was the source of infection? I mean, the site? Um, that was an MRSA, but I'm not remembering. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. 
Okay, somebody has mentioned amoxicillin, linozolid, is it true, right? Okay. So, any side effects if we use antibiogram? So, actually, uh, antibiogram is nothing but it's a process. So, basically, you have a data. It's like a database. So, side effect can be of a drug. Side effect can be of any medicine. But then using a database to justify your choices, I think the effect has to be more important than knowing about the side effect at that time. So, yeah. Yes. So, guys, uh, more questions? Excuse me, ma'am. Hello. Uh, ma uh, in our college, uh, we have got one case uh, as a presentation. In that case, a pregnant woman who was 26 years old, uh, she had come to antenatal visit and uh, uh, her urine culture was like more than 1 lakh bacteria per ml. And she had no other uh, uh, white blood cells or red blood cells in the urine. And uh, the sensitivity test was shown to be trimethoprime, uh, nitrofurantoin and uh, cephalaxin sensitive. Others are resistant. So in this case, we can't go with trimethoprine as there is a uh, uh, teratogenic, uh, like there is an effect on the kid. And nitrofurantoin, there is a effect again, and cephalaxin uh, even. So what will be the choice? Is there any newer drugs for the treatment? So first of all, absolutely correct. You have to treat because this falls into the category of asymptomatic bacteriuria. So that is the bacteriuria is there, but you have no symptoms. And in pregnant female, we are supposed to treat. So cephalexin, I still say that it is not a category D agent, which is counterindicated in pregnancy. You can still very well safely give cephalexin in the urinary tract infections. The second choice I would like to uh, say that if phosphomycin is an option, I would like to go for it. But then cephalexin, cefixin, cefepodoxine, they can be used in pregnancy with the caution. And they can be, you know, the benefit is to risk ratio is important. Like you already mentioned that nitrofurantoin and the, the sepranto for sure we cannot give. Nitrofurantoin also we can give in certain cases because, you know, the teratogenicity or the organogenesis occurs in the first trimester already. So if the patient is landing up into the second or third, we can go for a nitrofurantoin based options as well. So these are the few options which I would like to give in this patient. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Okay, there is one question uh, in our chat box. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, can we use deptomycin in case of MRSA related pneumonia? Hello. Hello. Your Anji? voice is not uh, clear. Hello. Yeah. Ma'am, can we use daptomycin in case of MRSA related pneumonia? You are asking daptomycin and MRSA pneumonia, right? Yes. Mm, so, Shubham, the answer is actually no. So, it's not because it's a MRSA, but it is because pneumonia. So, daptomycin does not penetrate in lungs. It, ha it gets deactivated by the lung surfactant. And uh, that is why daptomycin two places with MRSA even, you are not supposed to use dapto is the lung and the urine because there is no effective penetration of that drug into these two areas. Oh, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. I had one question. Mm hmm uh, can we use this uh, antimicrobial chemotherapy uh, while the patient is suffering from uh, what we call it as a menstrual phase means uh, will it uh, increase decrease any bleeding side effects ma'am so usually they don't provided you don't have a already a known case of some kind of the disturbances but in an otherwise normal individual with the menstrual bleed I'm sure that if you're not talking about in the terms of a critically ill patient with a lot of platelet dysfunctioning and everything happening, the case scenario is different. But if you ask me on the OPD basis with the oral antibiotics and the menstrual issues, that won't cause much an effect. Yeah, exactly, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome.
I hope I'm audible. Okay. So Anirudh is asking that in case discussed until anti-biogram test results, uh, what empirical therapy should be used in any specific guidelines? Uh, so in that scenario, that depends upon the site specific. So for example, your patient has come up with the safe fever with the shortness of breath and you are suspecting a pneumonia uh, likely to be a community vis a vis a health tech where required. So in most of the Indian settings, since we have a data from ICMR, majority of the bugs are already resistant to your ceftriaxon or you know the cephalosporins. So either you can go for piperacillin tazobactam, cefepirazone salbactam, or even meropenem based upon which area you are in. So these are the rational choices that all depends upon the site specific and the area specific then. Yeah, there is one more question that, uh, what are the uh, common monitoring parameters for newer antimicrobials? So common, so while you are on the newer antimicrobials, so see majority of the newer antimicrobials class, if I are, say categorize into gram negative and gram positive, so in gram negative, the majors are the beta lactam and their inhibitor combinations. So since they are of the beta lactam class, the best, the way to monitor is your, your renal function parameters. In few of the uh, antibiotics, which I have also mentioned, the coagulation profile, and in few, you have to see from the liver function test. And one common, though rare, but one of the commonest side effects is Clostridium difficile diarrhea. So the over usage of the beta lactam over a period of time can result in the antibiotic associated diarrhea, most commonly caused by C. difficile. So these are the three, four areas which you need to monitor while you're on the newer therapies for gram negative. For gram positive, the few, bacteria, the few drugs which we discussed like daptomycin, see about the CPK levels. It causes a myopathy. It causes the liver enzymes derangement and it can also causes the eosinophilic pneumonia. So daptomycin itself can cause a eosinophilic pneumonitis and it cannot be used in pneumonia. And like tedizolid is a same cousin as the linozolid. So it can also cause a bone marrow suppression, neuropathy, optic neuritis. And then the, in the gram positives, we have the omada cyclines and all. So like the other tetracycline group, they can also cause the hepatotoxicity. So these are the some factors to look for the gram positive newer, newer antimicrobials. Yes, uh, Dr. Neha. So uh, someone is asking a question in, uh, you know, related to this question only or extension of this question. What is the best option to manage antibiotic induced gastroenteritis, uh, including diarrhea, bloating or heart burning? So if it is, you know, minimal, so we have to first of all see the benefit is to risk ratio. So for example, the benefit of a giving an A antibiotic is more more superseded with risk. You have to give it. As far as the gastrointestinal side effects are considered, if it's mild, I usually give probiotics along with it. So that, that maintains the gut integrity through the probiotic capsules or the sachets. And then if it is severe, like I said, if it's a watery diarrhea for three, four, five times, greenish colored, think about the anti antibiotic associated diarrhea. C. difficile, get it tested. Either you can then give a metronidazole or an oral vancomycin. Yes. Any more questions, guys? Ma'am. Hanji? Uh, Ma'am, I have a case that uh, a patient uh, came with a history of RTA and later uh, he diagnosed as uh, meningitis and patient also presented with uh, watery diarrhea and the physician uh, prescribed that androgermina. Okay. And, okay. And after one week of androgermina, in, in his blood culture, bacillus callosi has grown. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, physician given that IV, um, what? Yeah, I, vancomycin 250 that um, for CDF. And also he have given, uh, I, IV cholestin he have given. Okay. And later uh, in CSF, uh, that same bacillus callosi has grown. Okay. And so, the intra, yeah, intrathecal intra cholestin they have given. And after one week, still the temperature and total count was more. And they escalated to uh, 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 intrathecal amicacin and intrathecal vango. But still, that uh, in CSF, that bacillus callosi is there. No any improvement in, the, in that patient. So I'm sure, Shabana, the patient is very, very sick, I guess. And yeah. 
too much of diarrhea and too much of breach is there and is yeah. the patient is on any kind of a shunt because you yes. have already given an intrathecal right yes yes so you know what has happened so this has happened to a gut transmigration whatever okay. probiotic you were given that itself the commensal bacteria because why i particularly saying intro germinia the most common composition is bacillus clausei yeah. and the same bacteria has actually transmigrated to your csf and everything so consider okay. that if you consider this as a pathogen number 1 you can mm. i mean since this is a gram positive bacilli so you yeah. have to deal with either kind of a vancomycin to continue in the injectable form with plus okay. minus intrathecal vancomycin can be given yeah. okay okay ma'am any other question guys um hello ma'am hello um uh, ma'am what if uh, the organism is resistant to almost all the antibiotics given for culture then what is the choice of treatment at that time so very tricky and very touchy question i think adna uh, because this is what we 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 are also not left with and the idea of putting up this lecture is i hope this situation should not arise in front of anyone in the future so uh then we have to see for the permutation combination so and one more thing i would like to say that you know just giving an iv antibiotic therapy does not solve the purpose so i'll give you an example a patient like we have shown in the cases also a patient is having a central line and you are giving one antibiotic 2 3 4 5 unless and until you don't remove that infected central line even if you give hundreds of antibiotics it's not going to work so this is the idea that in the cases of a totally pan drug resistant uh, bacteria with the limited options available in an indian settings you have to see the permutation combination along with the source reduction think about the other measures like for example i said because most of these patients who are on a pan drug resistant they have either some kind of devices uh, say foley's catheter central lines they have some kind of drains they have some kind of a collection see where the fever is coming from chase the target localize the source stop the source and along with the combination of the existing this is how we also proceed in such pan drug resistant cases uh ma'am does a uh, antibiotic breakpoint uh, helps in this case like how is it yeah so antibiotic breakpoint very much helps so idea is that you know the in vitro results and in vivo results definitely vary because in critically ill patients we have lot of issues with albumins and also protein binding activity takes a lot of toll in as compared to the lab results and as compared to the in patient so the antibiotic breakpoint is actually an mic with your pkpd combined together to see whether the drug is going to act in the body or not so that definitely helps in deciding the a choice and b the dose you have to at least keep the mic too long beyond the mic to keep the the drug active in the body so this is how the antibiotic breakpoints going to help okay ma'am thank you yes uh, so any other questions guys um good evening sir myself shudipta hello, hello. hi good yeah. evening shudipta Uh, good evening, ma'am. Actually, okay. I have questions regarding soft-tissue infections. Uh, patients have been suffering from uh, soft-tissue uh, soft infections uh, since uh, three to uh, six months, and she has been uh, treated with fluconazole, uh, metronidazole, and uh, different kinds of antifungal medicine like. Uh, clotrimazole myconazole etc but uh, she is not uh, curable yet so which kind of uh, antibiotic you can be uh, preferred or you can advise to this patient uh, so so dita which area, i mean soft tissue infection of which area particularly you are uh, targeting uh, skin, uh, skin uh, uh, legs uh, hands back of uh, shoulder and uh, hair etc so so considering your uh, choice i mean the the already a history i think the patient is suffering from something called as a tinea infection or a dermatophytosis which which you are mentioning in the timeline and not the classical bacterial so if that is the case there are the cases of resistant dermatophytosis they sometimes helps to terbinafine or etraconazole long courses at times but then to say that it's a bacterial infection we need to see whether there is a, a collection or an abscess or some kind of a, you know suppurative uh, ooze out thing or a necrotic area 
then to think about in terms of the bacterial infections okay okay so uh, it's not curable even uh, apply uh, even even your uh, the patient has been taken the itraconazole also she is not uh, getting cured so i am just asking the which kinds of antibiotic you can prefer to this patient because uh, it's actually uh, i was working in a primary healthcare center and in in such area there are lots of patients uh, who has been suffering from such kinds of disease soft tissues disease soft tissues infections uh, infectious disease and mostly uh, they are taking uh, cetirizine uh, itraconazole uh, myconazole clotrimazole uh, metronidazole tinazole etc these types of antifungal medicine uh, still uh, they are not uh, they uh, would become not cured so for this reason i'm asking uh, which kinds of antibiotics uh, you can uh, be given to them uh, so so you- uh so there are two categories one is a skin and a superficial infection which is being caused by like you mentioned all the fungal yeah. and the antifungal and you should yeah. also see that what is the risk factor so same patient which you are talking about say she is a diabetic female with the hb1ac of 13 she is not going to respond to every time so you have okay. to control the primary risk factor you have to give a full course of therapy at a proper dosing along with sometimes i also give the topical antifungal as well we have liliconazole we have the clotrimazole yes, we have also to mention and then comes the second category of a soft tissue infection okay okay actually uh, the infection is related to superficial skin uh, superficial yes. it's not so, related to mm-hmm. yes, so if yes, you ma'am. ask me in terms of antibacterial in the superficial uh, and if i have to make a choice yeah i'm asking about the antibacterial or antibiotic medicine regarding this yes yes i'm coming to that by, uh, such kinds of antifungal medicine it cannot control this types of superficial infections because uh, patients have been cured but after a certain time uh, like one month two months this type of infections uh, comes again into this patient's uh, skin layers And for this reason i am asking like this so if you are asking antibiotic orally the best way then i should say a broad spectrum amoxicillin clavulanate the augmentin can be a very well used and tried in the superficial skin infection if you want to dig deeper uh, for example if this the prevalence of mrsa is quite high in your area you can go ahead with the linozolate because that also has a very good skin soft tissue cover and in case of antifungals if you want to escalate also you can have then the voriconazole and even the pica- the posaconazole for the the better penetration Yes, ma'am. Sometimes, actually, patients uh, may suffer from swelling also due to the superficial infections. So, uh, after using fluconazole and uh, this kinds of uh, fungal category, antifungal medicine. Uh, okay, ma'am. I'm satisfied with your answer. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I have one more question uh, from uh, Nagul. He is asking. I want to hear from you about the face therapy, which will be helpful in pain resistance. and he has shared some uh, you know nature uh, review paper also here so so nakul uh, honestly i am very happy that somebody asked because i used it to to in patients because in india the fast therapy is actually in the still in a research mode so luckily we were able to collaborate with dr gopal nath who is in bhu and he is working very extensively on this bacterial fast therapy so since in the paucity of time yeah. so the, the slide which i have shown about the different classes so there was a one area which was alternative to the antibiotic agent so phage therapy is basically a bacteriophage therapy and like the name suggests the phages or the viruses which are designed against the bacteria so i have used in the uh, one patient which was difficult to uh, treat uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa skin soft tissue infection after a burn injury we have tried a b c d a to z you name it when we had tried all the kinds of infection and also recently i have uh, given to a patient who had a kidney transplant in 2006 and then retransplant in 2017 and since 2018 to 22 he has almost 16 episodes of urinary tract infections and every time the patient comes with the klebsiella pneumonia 10 raised to power 5 and more colony counts proper symptomatic urine kidney creatinine rises up to 5 6 and then we have to give initially we gave colistine then the next time he got resistant to that and this time we have to give him zeviceftan astrinam now he responded and the last 3 months i have given him the phage therapy which we ordered from like i said from bhu so they are actually the lytic phages which works against the bacteria 
and they can be given either in the IV formulations or the topical ones. We have used both because it was little uh, costly thing to do. So as per the patient uh, satisfaction and details, so we tried IV for say seven days and then we used in the topical formulation. So we have a lot of names available. So most commonly we use a T4 FAG therapy, which we have tried in one of my patients. I hope you got your answer, uh, Nagun. Okay, so I think we should stop the question answer session now. Uh, one more question I want to take from YouTube actually. Uh, Lubna is asking a urine culture showed E. coli with uh, more than one leg uh, cells sensitive to okay, nitrofurantoin, ceftriaxone, meropenem, and piptase. Which one is best in these four? First of all, your patient is quite lucky. That uh, the common yes. the common drugs are still very sensitive to this. So uh, then in that scenario, Lubna, I would like to know about the clinical status of the patient. If it's an OPD based patient with otherwise a stable just a cystitis like symptoms, I would definitely go with the nitrofurantoin. But if My, the same, yeah. but if the same patient is landed up in the say ICU with some way lucky this kind of a picture. I would and landed up in a kind of a complicated UTI. I would like to prefer then the either a peptase or even the artapenem is a very good drug of choice or amikacin if that is sensitive in those kind of scenarios. Okay, thank you. So thank you guys, and uh, you know I would like to announce one more thing that uh, Dr. Neha is uh, you know again joining us on twenty third of April, and she will be talking about. Uh, you know, the dose adjustment in OBs and elderly patients in antibiotics, you know. So, yes, you can join again. I mean, uh, of course, our uh, entire series. And uh, we have Dr. Rastogi again on 23rd of uh, April. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rastogi, for, uh, you know, joining us mm -hmm. and uh, delivering the wonderful, uh, you know, talk on the newer antimicrobials. And even I came to know a few things. And, uh, you know, I have learned a lot, uh, you know, from all these uh, things as uh, you know, I'm practicing now in uh, you know uh, diabetes area as uh, from ICMR and uh, you know cardiology. So these are very uh, this, this was very informative and it was amazing. Thank you very thank much. You. So thank you all. Thank you for your very patient yes, listening. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Take care and uh, happy festive eve, everyone. Take care. Thank you all. Okay. See ya. Thank you. See ya. See ya. See ya, Dr. Neha. Thank you.